Hey, how's it going, you fans? I'm Demi Bo Bemi. <laughs> and I'm dead inside. Are you just getting like more and more energized? Or are you starting to get delirious? I think I had too much sugar. I'm old now and sugar affects me. It's always affected you. <laughs> I think I just had too many Thin Mints in a row. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome back to another eldest. Um, in the last episode, we walked through a forest, and we walked and we walked. There was like a weird, sexy time fertility festival that the music was wafting through the air, and everyone was like fucking weird. Then we walked some more. <laughs> we walked, and then we got to uh, the city. The trees I had, Mira. yeah. I almost said Islanzadi, but that's a person. Um, there was house trees. They seemed pretty cool. Then we met the queen, and the queen said, You are my daughter. Well, she didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but she said something. She said, Oh, how I have wronged you, my daughter. Yep. And like sorry, his mom. We didn't, that wasn't confirmed. I just <clears throat> said that because I read the. You just said that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> cool. All right. Let us. Let, let us, us find <laughs> out. Let us. Burger King foot lettuce. There's something about that <clears throat> voice that you do that I just really like enjoy the sound of it. And I don't know why. Chapter 27 Queen Islan Zadi. Aragon knelt before the queen of the elves and her counselors in a fantastic room made from the boles of living trees in a near mythic land. And the only thing that filled his mind was shock. Arya is a princess! It was fitting in a way. She had always possessed an air of command, but he bitterly regretted the fact, for it placed another barrier between them that he would have torn... <laughs> or, um, wait, what? For it placed another barrier between them when he would have torn them all away. Um, which makes sense why she was like, don't act so familiar with me. Because she was like, bitch, I'm royalty. But like, you can't act familiar with the princess. She's like, you're too lowbrow for me. That's what she said in her you mind. You human. I won't <laughs> ride. That's why she was like, I won't ride in on a donkey. Princesses don't ride donkeys. Get it straight. She's like, you're a donkey, Aragon. Yeah, you're close to being a fucking donkey in my <laughs> eyes. The knowledge filled his mouth with the taste of ashes. Wait, what the? F Is he having a stroke? Is he okay? <laughs> <laughs> the princess <laughs> just fucking strokes out, passes out, chapter ends. <laughs> Hell yeah. He remembered Angela's prophecy that he would love one of noble birth and her warning that she could not see if it would end for good or for ill. He could feel Sephira's own surprise, then her amusement. She said, It appears that we have been traveling in the presence of royalty without knowing it. Why didn't she tell us? Perhaps it would have placed her in greater danger. Islanzari Drotning said Arya formally. The queen withdrew as if she had been stung and then repeated in the ancient language, Oh, my daughter, I have wronged you. She covered her face. Ever since you disappeared, I've barely slept or eaten. I was haunted by your fate and I feared that I would never see you again. Banning you from my presence was the greatest mistake I have ever made. Can you forgive me? The gathered elves stirred with amazement. Arya's response was long in coming, but at last she said, for seventeen ye or seventy, for seventy years I have lived and loved, fought and killed, without ever speaking to you, my mother. Our lives are long, but even so, that is no small span. For 70, 70 years, she's a hundred years old. So when she was thirty, her parents were like, "Fuck you, you're banned." Who speaks to people like that? Like what? How are you speaking? Like, oh, my mother. It's been 70 years. She didn't say, oh, my mother. Fuck it, whatever. I don't know. She said, for 70 years, I have lived and loved, fought and killed without ever speaking to you. Like. My mother. <laughs> 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 it 
Islanzandi drew herself upright, lifting her chin. A cham tre chuchi. Mm. A tremor ran her length. I cannot undo the past, Arya. No, no matter how much I might desire to. And I cannot forget what I endured. Nor should you. Islanzadi clasped her daughter's hands. Arya, I love you. You are my only family. Go if you must. But unless you wish to renounce me, I would be reconciled with you. For a terrible moment, it seemed as if Arya would not answer, or worse, would reject the offer. Aragon saw her hesitate and quickly look at her audience. Then she lowered her eyes and said, No, mother, I could not leave. Islanzadi smiled uncertainly and embraced her daughter again. This time, Arya returned the gesture and smiles broke out among the assembled elves. I kind of... Wanted her to be like, fuck you, mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, firstly, I kind of wanted her to not be a princess. Like, I didn't want Angela's fortune telling to be so, like, literal. I wanted it to be a little more like, ooh, it's up for interpretation, but your initial thought was, like, literal. But, like, she's literally of noble birth. <clears throat> I do like the idea of, like, not such a literal interpretation, but it also would have been cool if Arya, like Queen Azanzadi, didn't renounce her previous statement mm -hmm. or whatever. And so that like technically Arya is of noble birth, but she was still, but she was like not a princess anymore. Right. Or something like, like yeah. some drama, some tea got Ooh. spilt there. And so like that technically she's of noble birth and like they have like a love relationship type of thing, but she's not like a princess. Right. That, that would have been kind of cool. Yeah. Missed opportunity. The white raven hopped on his stand cackling or the white raven hopped on his stand cackling and on the door was graven evermore and now became the family lore. Let us never do but to adore. Okay. Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah, evermore. Get, out, get out of here. Hush, Bladgen, said Idzon Zadi to the raven. Keep your doggerel to yourself. Breaking free, the queen turned to Aragon and Sephira. You must excuse me for being s discourteous and ignoring you, our most important guests. Aragon touched his lips and then twisted his right hand over his sternum, as Arya had taught him. Idzon Zadi dropped Ning, Astra Sterni O no Thelduin. He had no doubt that he was supposed to speak first. Islan Zadi's dark eyes widened. Atra du avarnya onovarda. Un atra mora nanar lifa unin hratar oner, replied Aragon, completing the ritual. He could tell the elves were caught off guard by his knowledge of their customs. I'm surprised he retained any of that information, except for like just like not like bits and pieces, you know? He's as good with words and languages and shit. I don't know. I just feel like she for five minutes, she was like, here's what you do. Like, how mm -hmm. do you learn that? They worked on it for hours. Whatever. In his mind, he listened as Safira repeated his greeting to the queen. When she finished, Islan Zadi asked, Dragon, what is your name? Safira, a flash of recognition, appeared in the queen's expression, but she made no comment on it. Welcome to Elismira, Safira, And yours, Ryder? Like, bitch, like, you don't know my name? <laughs> Aragon Shade Slayer, your majesty. This time, an audible stir rippled among the elves seated behind them. Even Islan Zadi appeared startled. You carry a powerful name, she said softly, one that we rarely bestow upon our children. Welcome to Elismira, Aragon Shade Slayer. We have waited long for you. She moved on to Orc, greeted him, then returned to her throne and draped her velvet cloak over her arm. I assume by your presence here, Aragon, so soon after Saphira's egg was captured, and by the ring on your hand and sword on your hip, that Brahm is dead, and that your training with him was incomplete. I wish to hear your full story, including how Brahm fell, and how you came to meet my daughter, or how she met you, as it may be. Then I will hear of your mission here. Dwarf, end of your adventures, Arya, since your ambush in Dewald and Varden. Aragon had narrated his experiences before, so he had no trouble reiterating them now for the queen. The few occasions where his memory faltered, Sephira would provide an accurate description of events. In several places, he simply left the telling to her. When they finished, Aragon retrieved Nasawada's scroll from his pack and presented it to Islan Zadi. 
She took the roll of parchment, broke the red wax seal, and upon completing the missive, sighed and briefly closed her eyes. I see now the true depth of my folly. My grief would have ended so much sooner if I had not withdrawn our warriors and ignored Ajahat's messengers after learning that Arya had been ambushed. I should have never blamed the Varden for her death. For one so old, I am still far too foolish. A long silence followed, as no one dared to agree or disagree. Summoning his courage, Aragon said, Since Arya has returned alive, will you agree to help the Varden like before? Nasawada cannot succeed otherwise, and I am pledged to her cause. My quarrel with the Varden is as dust in the wind, said Izanzadi. Fear not, we will assist them as once we did, or as we once did, and more because of you and their victory over the Urgles. She leaned forward on one arm. Will you give me Brahm's ring, Aragon? Without hesitation, he pulled it off his finger and offered it to the queen, who plucked it from his palm with her slim fingers. You should not have worn this, Aragon, as it was not meant for you. However, because of the aid you have rendered the Varden and my family, I now name you Elfbrand and bestow this ring, Arin, upon you, so that all elves, wherever you go, will know that you are to be trusted and helped. Aragon thanked her and returned the ring to his finger, acutely aware of the queen's gaze, which remained upon him with disturbing perception, studying and analyzing. He felt as if she knew everything that he might say or do. She said, Such tidings as yours we have not heard the like of in Duwald and Varden for many a year. We are accustomed to a slower way of life here than the rest of Alagazia, and it troubles me that so much could occur so swiftly without word of it reaching my ear. And what of my training? Aragon snatched a furtive glance at the seated elves, wondering if, wondering if any of them could be Tokira Ikonoka, the being who had reached into his mind and freed him of Durza's foul influence after the battle in Farthendur, just in case we forgot, <laughs> and who had also encouraged Aragon to travel to Ilismira. That I totally forgot about. It will begin in the fullness of time, yet I fear that instructing you is futile so long as your infirmity persists. Unless you can overcome the Shade's magic, you will be reduced to no more than a figurehead. You may still be useful, but only as a shadow of the hope Fuck that we have nurtured for over a century. Knew it. You hear that last part? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I was just um, reveling in the fact that I knew that there was magic. You will be reduced to no more than a figurehead. Oh, yeah. You may still be useful, but only as a shadow of the hope that we have nurtured for over a century. Fucking brutal words. Oof. Islanzadi sp spoke without reproach, yet her words struck Aragon like hammer blows. He knew that she was right. Your situation is not your fault, and it pains me to voice things, such things, but you must understand the gravity of your disability. I am sorry. The is then Islanzadi addressed Oric. It has been long since one of your race entered our halls, dwarf. Aragon Finierel, Finierel, Aragon Finierel has experienced, or Aragon Finierel has explained your presence. But do you have aught to add? Only royal greetings from my king Hrothgar and a plea, now unneeded for you to resume contact with the Varden. Beyond that, I am here to see that the pact that Brom forged between you and the humans is honored. We keep our promises whether we utter them in this language or in the ancient language. I accept Hrothgar's greeting and return them in kindly. Or return them in kind. Finally, as Aragon was sure she had long to do since they first arrived, Islanzadi looked at Arya and asked, Now, daughter, what befell you? Arya began to speak in a slow monotone, first of her capture and then of her long imprisonment <laughs> and torture at Gilead. Safira and Aragon had deliberately avoided the details of her abuse, but Arya herself seemed to have no difficulty recounting what she had been subjected to. Her emotionless descriptions roused the same rage within Aragon as when he first saw her wounds. The elves remained completely silent throughout Arya's tale, although they gripped their swords and their faces hardened into razor lines of cold anger. A single tear rolled down Islanzadi's cheek. Afterward, a, life, a lithe elf lord paced along the mossy sword between the chairs. I know that I speak for us all, Arya Dratningu, when I say that my heart burns with sorrow for your ordeal. It is a crime beyond apology. Mitigation, a reparation, reparation, and Galbatorix must be punished for it. Also, we, in your, we are in your debt for keeping the locations of our cities hidden from the shade. Few of us could have withstood him for so long. Thank you, Death Dervor. Now, as Anzadi spoke, and her voice rang like a bell among the trees. Enough! 
Our guests wait, tired on their feet, and we have spoken of evil things for far too long. I will not have this occasion mar marred by lingering on past injuries. A glorious smile brightened her expression. My daughter has returned. A dragon and her rider have appeared, and I will see us celebrate in proper fashion. She stood tall and magnificent in her crimson tunic and clapped her hands. At the, si at the sound, the chairs and pavilion were showered with hundreds of lilies and roses that appeared twenty feet above their heads and drifted down like colorful snowflakes, suffusing the air with their heady fragrance. She didn't even use ancient language, observed Aragon. He noticed that while everyone was occupied by the flowers, Izanzadi touched Arya gently on the shoulder and murmured almost too softly to hear, You never would have res or you never would have suffered so if you had taken my counsel. counsel. I was right to oppose your decision to accept the Yahweh. It was my decision to make. The queen paused, then nodded and extended her arm. Bladgen! With a flutter of wings, the raven flew from his perch and landed on, the le on her left shoulder. The entire assembly bowed as Izanzadi proceeded to the end of the hall and threw open the door to the hundreds of elves outside, whereupon she made a brief declaration in the ancient language that Aragon did not understand. The elves burst into cheers and began to rush about. What did she say? whispered Aragon to Nari. Nari smiled. To break open our finest casks and light the cook fires, for tonight shall be a night of feast and song. Come! He grabbed Aragon's hand and pulled him after the queen as they threaded their way, threaded her way between the shaggy pines and through banks of cool ferns. During their time indoors, the sun had dropped low in the sky, drenching the forest with an amber light that clung to the trees and plants like a layer of glistening oil. Oh. Get ready for some description, dude. <sighs> okay, let's go. Uh, oh, back to just a moment ago. Queen is on Zondi, basically. Fucking told you so. Yeah, tell like Nari, wow. Okay, so. not appropriate. After hearing like the recount of like what her daughter endured, she's like, "Told you so." Like that's a little bit sh too shitty for me. I think like there's a line, and I think she crossed it. Agreed. <laughs> <clears throat> you do realize, don't you? Said Sephira. That the king Lefeyan mentioned Evendar must be Arya's father. Aragon almost stumbled. You're right. And that means he was killed by either Galbatorix or the Forsworn. Circles within circles. They stopped on the crest of a small hill where a team of elves had settled a long trestle table and chairs. All around them, the forest hummed with activity. As evening approached, the cheery glow of fires appeared scattered throughout Ellis Mira, including a bonfire near the table. Someone handed Aragon a goblet made of the same odd wood that he had noticed in Saris. <clears throat> he drank the cup's clear liqueur and gasped as it blazed down his throat. It tasted like mulled cider mixed with mead. Mmm. I'm into it. It's like a sizer. The potion made the tips of his fingers and ears tingle and gave him a marvelous sense of clarity. What is this, he asked Nary. Absinthe. <laughs> Nary laughed. Falnerf? We distill it from crushed elderberries and spun moonbeams. <laughs> okay. I was just about to be like, maybe a possible recipe idea, <laughs> but then I was like, okay, I don't know how to get moonbeams. <laughs> <laughs> if he needs must, a strong man can travel for three days on naught else. Safira, you have to taste this. She sniffed the goblet, then opened her mouth, and allowed him to pour the rest of the foul nerve down her throat. Her eyes widened and her tail twitched. Now that's a treat. Is there more? Before Aragon could reply, Oryx stomped over to them. Daughter to the queen, he grumbled, shaking his head. I wish that I could tell Hrothgar and Nal Sawada. They'd want to know. Izanzadi seated herself in a high-backed chair and clapped her hands once again. From within the city came a quartet of elves bearing musical instruments. Two had harps of cherry wood, the third a set of reed pipes, and the fourth nothing but her voice, which she immediately put to use with a playful song that danced about their ears. Aragon caught only every word or so, but he did. But what he did understand made him grin. It was a story of a stag who could not drink at a pond because a magpie kept harassing him. As Aragon listened, his gaze wandered and alighted upon a small girl prowling behind the queen. When she looked again, he saw that her shaggy hair was not silver, like many of the elves, but bleached white with age, and her face was creased and lined like a dry withered apple. She was no elf, nor dwarf, nor, Aragon felt, even human. She smiled at him, and he glimpsed rows of sharp teeth. 
When the singer finished and the pipes and lutes filled the silence, Aragon found himself approached by scores of elves who wished to meet him, and more importantly, he sensed Sephira. The elves presented themselves by bowing softly and touching their lips with their first and middle fingers, to which Aragon responded in kind, along with endless repetitions of their greeting in the ancient language. They plied Aragon with polite questions about his exploits, but they reserved the bulk of their conversation for Sephira. At first, Aragon was content to let Sephira talk, since this was the first place where anyone was interested in having a discussion just with her. But he soon grew annoyed at being ignored. <clears throat> he had become used to having people listen when he spoke. <laughs> he fucking ego. He wow. grinned ruefully dismayed that he had come to rely on people's attention so much since he had joined the Varden and forced himself to relax and enjoy the celebration. That's good like immediate yeah at least he can self-recognition yeah like self-realize and then chill the fuck out just enjoy the celebration man drink some of that fail nerve get fucked up again like the last time you partied yolo that's, that's the fucking way to party before long the scent of food permeated the glade and elves appeared carrying potters piled with delicacies aside from loaves of warm bread and stacks of small round honey cakes the dishes were made entirely of fruit vegetables and berries the berries predominated. They were in everything from blueberry soup to raspberry sauce to thimbleba thimbleberry jelly. A bowl of sliced, sliced apples. Almost said sliced assholes. <laughs> like, I could feel it. A bowl of sliced apples dripped with syrup and sprinkled with wild strawberries sat beside a mushroom pie stuffed with spinach, thyme, thyme, and currants. No meat was to be found, not even fish or fowl which still puzzled Aragon. In Carvajal and elsewhere in the Empire, meat was a symbol of status and luxury. The more gold you had, the more often you could afford steak and veal. Even the minor nobility ate meat with every meal. To do otherwise would indicate a deficit in their coffers, and yet the elves did not subscribe to this philosophy, despite their obvious wealth and the ease with which they could hunt with magic. The elves rustled to the table with an enthusiasm that surprised Aragon. Or the elves rushed to the table with an enthusiasm that surprised Aragon. Soon, all were seated, Islan Zadi at the head of the table with Blagin the raven, Dathar to her left, Arya and Aragon by her right hand, Orc across from them, and then all the rest of the elves, including Nari and Leif, Leif Lefeyan. No chair was at the far end of the table, only a huge carved plate for Sephira. <clears throat> As the meal progressed, everything dissolved around Aragon into a blur of talk and mirth. He was so caught up in the festivities, he lost track of time aware of only the laughter and the foreign words swirling over his head and the warm glow left in his stomach by the foul nerve. The elusive harp music sighed and he whispered at the edges of his hearing and sent, or wait, the elusive harp music sighed and whispered at the edges of his hearing and sent shivers of excitement down his side. Occasionally he found himself distracted by the lazy, slit, eyed stare of the woman child, <laughs> <laughs> which she kept focusing or kept focused on him with single-minded intensity, even while eating. This girl's just fucking straight up staring at her. Him. I keep referring to Aragon as a her. He's quite feminine. During a lull in the conversation, Aragon turned toward Arya, turned toward Arya, who had uttered no more than a dozen words. He said nothing, only looked and wondered who she really was. Arya stirred. Not even Ajahad knew. What? Outside of Duwald and Varden, I told no one of my identity. Brom was aware of it. He first met me here, but he kept it a secret at my request. Aragon wondered if she was explaining to him out of, out of a sense of duty or because she felt guilty for deceiving him in Sephira. Brom once said that what elves didn't say was often more important than what they did. He understood as well. Why, though? Did it matter if anyone knew? This time, Arya hesitated. When I left Elismira... I had no desire to be reminded of my position, nor did it seem relevant to my task with the Varden and the doors. It had nothing to do with who I became, with who I am. She glanced at the queen. You could have told said fear in me. She could have, but like, did she need to? Like, was I, like, again, was it relevant to them? Not with who she is. <clears throat> Arya seemed to bridle at the reproach, reproach in his voice. I had no reason to suspect that my standing with Izan Zadi had improved, and telling you that would have changed nothing. My thoughts are my own, Aragon. He flushed at her implied meaning. Why should she, who was a diplomat, a princess, an elf, and older than both his father and grandfather, whoever they were, confide in him, a 16-year-old human? At least, he muttered, you made up with your mother. She smiled oddly. Did I have a choice? 
At that moment, Blagin jumped from Islanzadi's shoulder and strutted down the middle of the table, bobbing his head left and right in a mocking bow. <clears throat> he stopped before Safira, uttered a hoarse cough, <coughs> and then croaked. Dragons like wagons have tongues. Dragons like flagons have necks. But while two hold beer, the other eats deer. The elves froze with mortified expressions while she waited for Safira's reaction. After a long silence, Safira looked up from her quince pie and released a puff of smoke that enveloped Blagin and little birds too, she said, projecting her thoughts so everyone could hear. The elves finally laughed as Blagin staggered back, cawing indignantly and flapping his wings to clear the air. I must apologize for Blagin's wretched verses, said Islan Zadi. He has ever had a saucy tongue, despite our attempts to tame it. Apology accepted, said Safira calmly and returned to her pie. Where does he come from? Aragon asked, eager to return to more cordial footing with Arya, but also genuinely curious. Blagin, said Arya, once saved my father's life. Evandar was fighting an Urgle when he stumbled and lost his sword. Before the Urgle could strike, a raven flew at him and pecked out his eyes. No one, know why, no one knows why the bird did it, but the distraction allowed Evandar to regain his balance and so win the battle. My father was always generous, so he thanked the raven by blessing him with spells for intelligence and long life. However, the magic had two effects that he did not foresee. Blagin lost all color in his feathers, and he gained the ability to predict certain events. There you go. Thanks. He can see into the future? Said Aragon, startled. See? No. But perhaps he can sense what is to come. In any case, he always speaks in riddles, which most of which are a fair bit of nonsense. Just remember that if Blagin ever comes to you and tells you something that is not a joke or a pun, you would do well to heed his words. Once the meal had concluded, his Zadi stood, causing a flurry of activity as everyone hastened to do likewise, and said, It is late, I am tired, and I would return to my bower. Accompany me, Saphir and Aragon, and I will show you where you may sleep tonight. At the foot of my bed, where you belong, <laughs> peasants. <laughs> <laughs> the queen motioned with one hand to Arya and left the table. Arya followed. <laughs> you shall sleep at the foot of my bed, too, daughter. Peasant. As Aragon stepped around the table of Sephira, he paused by the woman child, caught by her feral eyes. All the elements of her appearance, from her eyes to her shaggy hair to her white fangs, triggered Aragon's memory. <gasps> Solombum! You're a werecat, aren't you? She blinked once and then bared her teeth in a dangerous smile. <laughs> That's what I imagine that like. Like, <laughs> I met one of your kin, Solombum, Sadbutt, in Tirm, and in Farthendor. Her grin widened. Hey, a good one he is. Humans bore me but he finds it amusing to travel with the witch Angela. Then her gaze switched to Sephira, and she uttered a throaty half growl, <laughs> half pearl of appreciation. Um, why did that sound like Lord Baelish? I don't know. Little finger. It, it just came out, okay? <laughs> like these, these, these personifications just come out of me. Okay. That's what I imagine her like. What is your name? Asked Sephira. Names be powerful things in the heart of do weld and varden, dragon. Yes, they are. Mm, oh, wow. <laughs> However, among the elves, I am known as a watcher and as quick paw and as a dream dancer. But you may know me as Maud. She tossed her name. She tossed her mane of stiff white bangs. You better catch up with the queen, younglings. She does not take lightly to fools or laggards. It was a pleasure meeting you, Maud, said Aragon. He bowed and Sephira inclined her head. Aragon glanced at Orc, wondering where the dwarf would be taken, and then pursued in Sanzadi to the foot of her fucking bed, <laughs> peasant. <laughs> they overtook the queen just as she reached the base of a tree. The trunk was ridged by a delicate staircase that spiraled up to a series of globular rooms, cupped and suspended in the tree's crown by a spray of branches. Isanzadi lifted an elegant hand and pointed at the eyrie. You needs must fly there, Safira. Our stairs were not grown with dragons in mind. Then she spoke to Aragon. This is where the leader of the dragon riders would dwell while in Elismira. I give it to you now, for you are the rightful heir to that title. It is your inheritance. Before Aragon could thank her, the queen swept past and departed with Arya, who held his gaze for a long moment before vanquished, vanishing 
deeper into the city. I get it. Inheritance. <laughs> Shall we see what accommodations they've provided us with? <laughs> Asked Safira. <laughs> she jumped into the air and sailed around the tree in a... Woo! <laughs> My voice is giving out. Fuck. How close <clears throat> are we? Close. Like 12 more minutes. Okay. She jumped into the air and sailed around the tree in a tight circle, balancing on one wingtip perpendicular to the ground. As Aragon took the first step, he saw that Islanzadi had spoken true. The stairs were one with the tree. The bark beneath his feet was smooth and flat from the many elves who traversed it, but it was still part of the trunk, as were the twisting cobweb banisters by his side and curved railing that slid under his right hand. It was close. It was like right teetering there. on the breaking point. <clears throat> because the stairs had been designed with the elves' strength in mind, they were steeper than Aragon was used to, and his cal calves and thighs soon began to burn. Japanese stairs are made steep. They are very steep. Are they stronger than us? Are Japanese people elves? Oh the my fair God. folk? He was breathing so hard when he reached the top. After climbing through a trap door in the floor of one of the rooms, he had to put his hands on his knees and bend over to pant. Why don't you just take the stairs slow? You don't need to run up them. He's just fucking sprinting up them. Like, holy shit, dude. Like, take your time. Once he recovered, or once recovered, he straightened and examined his surroundings. <clears throat> he stood in a circular vestibule with a pedestal in the center, out of which spiraled a sculpture of two pale hands and forearms that twined around each other without touching. The screen doors led from the vestibule, one to an austere dining room that might hold ten people at the most, one to a closet with an empty hollow in the floor that Aragon could think of no discernible use for, and the last to a bedroom overlooking and open to the wide expanse of Dewald and Varden. <clears throat> Taking a lantern from its hook in the ceiling, Aragon entered the bedroom, creating a host of shadows that jumped and swirled like madcap dancers. A teardrop gap large enough for a dragon pierced the outer wall. Inside the room was a bed situated so that he could watch the sky and the moon while lying on his back. A fireplace made of gray wood that felt as hard and cold as steel when he touched it, as if the timber had been compressed to unsurpassed density, and a huge low rim bowl set in the floor and lined with soft blankets where Saphira could sleep. Um, I like that the bed is situated so that you can, like, see, like, the world out there. I love it. I could live it's here. like a treehouse. I would love, yeah, I would love a house like this. <clears throat> even, as he even as he watched, she swooped down and landed on the edge of the opening, her scales twinkling like a constellation of blue stars. Behind her, the last rays of the sun streaked across the forest, painting the various ridges and hills with a hazy amber that made the needles glow like hot iron and chased the shadows back toward the violet, violet horizon. From their height, the city appeared as a series of gaps in the voluminous, voluminous, the city appeared as a series of gaps in the voluminous canopy, islands of calm in a restless ocean. Ellis Mira's true scope was now revealed. It extended for several miles to the west and to the north. I respect the writers even more if this is how Vrail normally lived, said Aragon. It's much simpler than I thought, or I expected. The entire structure rocked slightly in response to a breath of wind. Safira sniffed the blankets. We have yet to see Vrowengard, she cautioned, although he sensed that she agreed with him. As Aragon closed the screen to the bedroom, he saw something in the corner that he had missed during his first inspection, a spiral staircase that wound up a dark wood chimney. Thrusting the lantern before him, he cautiously ascended one step at a time. After about twenty feet, he emerged in a study furnished with a writing desk, stocked with quills, ink, and paper, but no parchment and another padded roost for a dragon to curl up on. The far wall also had an opening to fly through. Saphira, come see this. How? she asked. Through the outside. Aragon winced as layers of bark splintered and cracked under Saphira's claws while she crawled out of the bedroom and up the side of the compound to the study. Satisfied? he asked when she arrived. Saphira raked him with her sapphire eyes and proceeded to scrutinize the walls and furniture. I wonder, she said. How are you supposed to stay warm when the rooms are so open to the elements? I don't know. Aragon examined the walls on either side of the breach, running his hands over abstract patterns that had been coaxed from the trees that had been coaxed from the tree by the elves' songs. He stopped when he felt a vertical ridge embedded in the bark. He tugged on it, and a 
in a diaphanous. Is that right? Diaphanous? I'm guessing it's diaph diaphanous because like diaphragm, mm-hmm. diaphragm, diaphanous. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Sure. He tugged on it and a diaphanous membrane unspooled from within the wall. Pulling it across the portal, he found a second groove to hold the hem of the cloth. As soon as it was, as soon as it was fastened, the air thickened and became noticeably hotter. There's your answer, he said. He released the cloth and it lashed back and forth as it rewound itself. When they returned to the bedroom, Aragon unpacked while Sephira coiled upon her dais. He carefully arranged his shield, bracers, greaves, coif, and helm, then stripped off his tunic and removed his, leather, his shirt of leather-backed mail. He sat bare-chested on the bed and studied the oiled links, struck by their similarity to Sephira's scales. We made it, he bemused. Or he said, bemused. A long journey, but yes, we made it. We're lucky that misfortune did not strike upon the road. He nodded. Now we'll find out if it was worth it. Sometimes I wonder if our time would have been better spent helping the Varden. Aragon! You know that we need further instruction. Brom would have wanted it. Besides, Elismir and Izan Zadi were certainly worth coming all this way to see. Maybe. Finally, he, sa- <laughs> he asked. What do you make of all this? Sephira potted, parted her jaw slightly to show her teeth. I don't know. The elves keep more secrets than even Brom, and they can do things with magic that I never thought possible. I have no idea what methods they use to grow their trees into such shapes, nor how Islanzadi summon those flowers. It is beyond my ken. Aragon was relieved that he had not... Aragon was relieved that he was not the only one who felt overwhelmed. And Arya? What about her? You know who she really is. She hasn't changed. Only your perception of her. Sephira chuckled deep in her throat. (laughs) <laughs> where it sounded like stones grinding against each other and rested her head on her two front feet. The stars were bright in the sky now and the soft hoots of owls drifted through Ellis Mira. All the world was calm and silent as it slumbered away the liquid night. Aragon clambered underneath his downy sheets and reached to shudder the lantern, then stopped, his hand an inch from the latch. He was in the elves' capital, over a hundred feet in the air, lying in what used to be Vrail's bed. The thought was too much for him. He lost his mind, and he fucking died. (laughs) Rolling upright, he grabbed the lantern with one hand, Zarek with the other, and surprised Sephira by crawling into her dais and snuggling against her warm side. She hummed and dropped a velvet wing over him as he extinguished the light and closed his eyes. Together they slept, long and deep, in Ellis Mira. Chapter ended him unconscious. That's kind of sweet. Not that he was, it ended unconscious, but that he was, like, cuddling with Sephira. That's sweet. It's like childlike, you know what I'm saying? It's just sweet. Because well, like he's still a kid on this journey, you know? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> you ready? Yeah. This is the chapter I've been waiting for. It's like a page. <sighs> chapter 28, Out of the Past. <clears throat> Aragon woke at dawn, well-rested. He tapped Sephira's ribs, and she lifted her wing. Running his hands through his hair, he walked to the room's precipice and leaned against one side, bark rough against his shoulder. Below, the forest sparkled like a field of diamonds as each tree reflected the morning light with a thousand, thousand drops of dew. A thousand, thousand drops of dew. Shit. He jumped with surprise as Sephira dove past him, twisting like an auger toward the canopy before he pulled... Before she pulled up and circled through the sky, roaring with joy. Morning, little one, he smiled, happy that she was happy. He opened the screen to their bedroom, where he found two trays of food, mostly fruit, that had been placed by the lintel during the night. By the trays was a bundle of clothes with a paper note pinned to it. Aragon had difficulty deciphering deciphering the flowing script, since he had not read for over a month Oof. and had forgotten some of the letters, but at least he understood that it said, Greetings, Sephira Bajart Sculler and Aragon Shadeslayer, I, Belaine of House Mialandra, do humble myself and apologize to you, Sephira, for this unsatisfactory meal. Elves do not hunt, and no meat is to be had in Elismira, nor in any of her cities. If you wish, you can do as the dragons of old, or won't, and catch what you may into Wilden Varden. We only ask that you leave your kills in the forest and do... N- or in the forest so that our air and water remain untainted by blood. Aragon, these clothes are for you. They were worn by Niduin of Izanzadi's house and are her gift to you. May good fortune rule you over you. Peace, live in your heart, and the stars watch over you. 
Elaine, do holder. Something like that. Wait, what did they say? What's that last? Balin do holder. Wait. Oh. It just sounded that. familiar. Like this, like piece <coughs> yeah, of text. Yeah, that's what Arya taught Aragorn to say. That's what they're saying when they touch oh, the lips and Oh, okay, shit. okay, okay, okay. When Aragorn told Saphira the message, she said, it does not matter. I won't need to eat for a while after yesterday's meal. However, she did snap up a few seed cakes, just so I don't appear rude, she explained. <laughs> after Aragorn finished breakfast, he held the bundle of clothes onto his bed and carefully unfolded them, finding two full-length tunics of russet trimmed with thimbleberry green, a set of creamy leggings to wrap <laughs> his calves in, and three pairs of socks so soft they felt like liquid he pulled them through his hands. The quality of the fabric shamed the weaving of the woman of Carvajal, as well as the dwarf clothes he wore now. Aragon was grateful for the new raiment. His own tunic and breeches were sadly travel-worn from their weeks exposed to the rain and sun since farther endure. Stripping, he donned one of the luxurious tunics, savoring its downy texture. What the fuck is up with him and using the word downy so much? <clears throat> I guess maybe it's supposed to be like a luxurious feeling thing. I guess so. He had just laced on his boots when someone knocked on the screen to the bedroom. Come in, he said, reaching for Zarok. Oric er poked his head inside. Hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> then cautiously entered, testing the floor with his feet. He eyed the ceiling. Give me a cave any day instead of a bird's nest like this. How fared your night, Aragon? Safira? Well enough, and yours, said Aragon. He asked, but... I slept like a rock. The dwarf chuckled at his own jest. <laughs> then his chin sank into his beard and he fingered the head of his axe. I see you've eaten, so I'll ask you to accompany. Arya and the queen and a host of other elves await you at the base of a tree. He fixed Aragon with a testy gaze. Something is going on and they haven't told or something is going on that they haven't told us about. I'm not sure what they want from you, but it's important. Islanzani's as tense as a cornered wolf. I thought I'd warn you beforehand. Aragon thanked him. Then the two of them descended by way of the stairs, while Saphira glided to earth. They were met on the ground by Islan Zadi, arrayed in a mantle of ruffled swan feathers, which were like winter snow heaped upon a cardinal's breast. She greeted them and said, Follow me. Her wending course took the group to the edge of Elismira, where the buildings were few and the paths were faint from disuse. At the base of a wooded knoll, Islan Zadi stopped and said in a terrible voice, before we go any farther, the three of you must swear in the ancient language that you will never speak to outsiders of what you are about to see, not without permission from me, my daughter, or whoever may succeed us to the throne. Why should I gag myself? demanded Oric. Why indeed? asked Sephira. Do you not trust us? It is not a matter of trust, but of safety. We must protect this knowledge at all costs. It is our greatest advantage over Galbatorix, and if you are bound by the ancient language, you will never willingly reveal our secret. Is it a dragon? You came to sup supervise Aragon's training, Auric Voter. Unless you give me your word, you may as well return to Farthendur. At last, Auric said, I believe that you mean no harm to dwarves or to the Varden, else I would never agree. And I hold you to the honor of your hall and clan that this isn't a ploy to deceive us. Tell me what to say. While well, the queen tutored Auric in the correct pronunciation of the desired phrase, Aragon asked Saphira, Should I do it? Do we have a choice? Aragon remembered that Arya had asked the same question yesterday, and he began to have an inkling of what she had meant. The queen left no room to maneuver. <laughs> <laughs> when Oric finished, Islan Zadi looked expectantly at Aragon. He hesitated, then delivered the oath, as did Safira. Thank you, said Islan Zadi. Now we may proceed. At the top of the knoll, the trees were replaced by a bed of red clover that ran several yards to the edge of a stone cliff. The cliff extended a league in either direction and dropped a thousand feet to the forest below, which pooled outward until it merged with the sky. It felt as if they stood on the edge of the world, staring across an endless expanse of forest. She's going to push him off <laughs> the cliff. I know this place. Do you remember this place? Aragon has seen this before. <laughs> don't make that face at me. You don't make that face at me. He's seen it before, so they're on a cliff and there's forest. <clears throat> Are we sure that it's not Palancar Palancar Valley? 
I know this place, realized Aragon, remembering his vision of Togira. Togira Ikonoka. Oh, shit. Okay. Thud. The air shivered from the strength of the concussion. Thud. Another dull blow made Aragon's teeth chatter. Thud. He jammed his fingers in his ears, trying to protect them from the painful spikes and pressure. The elves stood motionless. Thud. The clover bent under, under a sudden gust of wind. Thud. From below the edge of the cliff rose a huge gold dragon with a rider on its back. Fuck! End. And then we go to Roran. Oh, and then, okay, listen. I, I'm not mad that we're going to Roran because I really like his story, but Safira was just saying that she was so sad that she was alone. And now she's not alone. I hope that she likes the dragon. That's exciting. I fucking had a feeling. I wonder what gave it away. Flap, flap. <laughs> that could have been fucking anything, I feel like. That could have been not even related. But then it was like what you're about to see, like you can't tell anyone, and it's like our greatest. That kind of gave it away. That was like obvious, I feel like. It's a dragon, hello. That's exciting. And then it's like, how fucking long have they had this dragon? Hiding. Where are they hiding a dragon? Nate said, you think this old ass dragon is going to want to smash Sephira? I don't know. She sounds pretty cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I think that the most important thing is, I mean, obviously the dragon is like super important, but also the rider. There is a rider still That's in existence true. outside of Galbatorix that exists. Teach Aragon ways of the rider, an actual rider teaching him how to be a rider. I mean, like, we know, like, okay, like, Braum was a rider, like, we get it. Yeah, but he was there for like five minutes. But he, like, didn't have a dragon. He wasn't, like, as powerful as a rider as he could have been because of the loss of his dragon. And he died pretty soon. And he died pretty soon. So it's kind of like the Braum redemption. Like, we get a Tokyo Braum o version o two. Oka. So, I don't know if you remember, you're... I thought it was either maybe, like, Brahms, like, like reincarnation or something. But I mean, now like, I'm not thinking that's really... I kind of, I guess, in a way. Yeah, it's like Brahm version 2.0. So, in a way, you're kind of right with, like, the spirit of Brahm. Like, it's... Spirit of Brahm. It's his, like, redemption at, like... Or his, like, oh, yeah. shit, I shouldn't have killed Brahm. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> I fucked up. Not really, but, yeah. I'm really interested to see, like, what happens. Also, why was it so loud? Why isn't Sephira that loud? Because it's a giant dragon. Oh, they don't stop growing, do they? Nope. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. There's no knowing how much they're growing, you know? Because all the signs are showing. The dragons just keep growing. I love it. That's exciting. Something happened. I feel like you're not as excited. <sighs> I thought, I don't know. Every, okay, so I feel like everyone's like, I'm so excited. And then it was like, okay, here's a fun trick. If you're really excited about something, don't hype it up. Because <laughs> <laughs> then it's like, I don't know what I'm expecting. You know, like, don't tell someone how funny a joke is because then, like, they have expectations. I mean, like, yeah. I'm excited, and it's really cool that, like, he's going to be trained by an actual writer instead of just, like, a bunch of elves. But you're just like, hmm. I mean, it's cool. And then yeah, also, like, cool. I'm tired, too. Gold dragon. Okay, hey. Giant gold dragon with a rider on its back. Um, Excuse me. I'm sorry, but it's fucking midnight 30. So it's a little late for me. I'm not usually up this late, okay? I am excited, though. I mean, like, I'm excited to, like, know more, but then it's, like... Oh my god, there's a dragon. Okay, now it's time for Roran. And so then it's like I don't like I don't get anything else after that. Now I just have to wait. But you do get to go back to Roran's story. I like how That's they left true. you on a cliffhanger on a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. Dude, I remember the first time I read that shit and I heard thud and I was like, fuck. And then I like well, because then I like was like thud, and I was like, is something stomping? 
Dude, stomping like, its way to I them. I wasn't as perceptive as you were when they were like, oh, you have to promise in the ancient language. I was like, what the fuck is they're going to show Aragon? They're going to show Aragon some magic fucking gem or something? And then dud. And I was like, what is happening? And then I saw a golden dragon on a rider. I had to reread that line like five times with that little sentence. I was like, fuck. I like threw the book down and run, ran out into the living room. And I was like, mom, dad, there's a fucking other dragon. It's a fucking golden dragon. <laughs> and then they were just like, Pretty much your response, like, <laughs> great. Now I feel guilty. And then I, like, fucking punched my dad and was like, there's a dragon. And I slapped him. I was like, there's a dragon. And then your dad had 12 knives. No. <laughs> and then my dad was like, stop. You're losing. And I started just running around in circles going, dot, 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 dot. <laughs> and then also, like, it's not like I'm not excited because it's cool. And, like, we already know there are other dragons. So then it's like, you know. It's cool that they have, like, a dragon and a dragon rider, but it's, like, we already know that there are other dragon eggs. And, like, because of the type of book it is, we're going to get the eggs. They're going to hatch. Like, for me, like, it seems like that's the road we're going down. And I feel like, for me, like, because of the type of book it is, I think it's going to happen. I just personally feel like that this was one of those, like, dragon reveals that was kind of unsuspected because, like, they have, like honed in on like the dragon eggs so much you yeah know, talked about the dragon eggs and how there's no dragon riders left and like you mm -hmm. know like rail was the last dragon what or whatever you know like all that shit and then all of a sudden like this giant gold dragon just rises from the cliffs and is like it is up bitch it is cool though that like he's like i'm a dragon rider and he like mind talked him and then aragon didn't even know he just was like who is this bitch yeah, that's an interesting perspective that, like, he got touched in his mind by a dragon rider and just didn't even realize what was going on. It is really interesting that he was just like, who is this person talking to me? And then... He didn't, like, recognize the mind touch feel. Like, you would think that it would feel different. Like, you would have, like, a... I guess he never recognized the mind touch feel with... Braum. Braum. But it was like he never had any experience with the mind touch with anyone else. You yeah, know? Just Brom. You think there would be a, a you, difference in the touch? Yeah. I don't know. It is kind of cool, though. Nate that says that he did say the present felt weird. But he okay. could have just been writing that off as an elf. That's true. He could have been. So many excuses could be brought up for, like, why the presence felt weird. And then, like... I bet that fucking dude was like, he's going to be so excited when he gets here. Just like waiting for Aragon. He's going to be so stoked. I'm a dragon rider. <laughs> <laughs> he's like fucking wait for it. His eyes are going to be so big. Like he doesn't even know I'm a dragon rider and I talk to him. He doesn't even get it. I'd be like place those bets guys. Like <laughs> think he's, his mouth is going to open. He's going to go. No much shit is going to be in his pants. <laughs> Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching. We now have a writer reveal, which is pretty dope. Thud, thud. <laughs> I'm excited to see what happens with Safira more than Aragon. I don't really care about, like, I don't know. Yeah, He's like, whatever. Get, you go get learned. Yeah, like, go fucking train or, like, learn to read or something. But how Safira but, reacts to having yeah, another dragon. That would be interesting. And to see, like, their interaction. Like, that's what I'm most interested in is, like, what do dragons do with dragons? bite each other probably kind of like similar to isaac and freya yeah but they're not as smart as dragons <laughs> <laughs> no they're fucking barely smarter than i don't a know fifth grader <laughs> <laughs> and then in the next episodes we get to go into fucking roaring again or into roaring story <laughs> go right into his body go right into him mm. into get his hard body into roaring story that'll be fun i'm excited because i need to know what crazy, irrational, irresponsible shit Roran's going to do to try to get Katrina back. Because you know he's going to lose his shit. You know it. I know it. In my heart. Hopefully in the next recordings, this wall will be chalkboard wall. Black like my heart. But thank you guys so much for watching. Drop us a like. You like the video. Drop us a comment in the comment section below about what do you think is going to happen and Probably not the next couple episodes because we're probably going to be reading Roran and not get back to Aragon. But so let us know what you think is going to happen with Roran. What's he going to do? What's he up to? What's he going to do? 
pointing when they come for you. <laughs> I'm so glad you got that. <laughs> We're like the same. Whoa. Wow. And we'll see you in the next one. I hope you dream about it. Nate was saying that. I hope you dream about it too. I hope you have a fucking dream that I you're probably, standing on the cr- the the cliff. I'm going to have a dream. I'm in Japan and then there's dragons. No, you're standing on a cliff in Japan and then a giant golden dragon flies above you, shattering your teeth with its force. Whomping. Yeah, with its 